Scott and I joined the project that um, Heather and myself and John used to be involved in, which is called um, Disaster Bioethics. So this is a, it's a cost network uh, that involves a lot of disaster responders, uh, medics, um, ethicists, philosophers, lawyers, anthropologists who are working with this topic of disaster. Um, and usually, I mean, what we are discussing within that project relates to ethical decision making within a particular disaster. So how is it in, in a particular disaster that I should uh, divide up my resources and, and so forth. But for today, um, thank you for inviting me, I, I thought that I'd like to do something a little bit different. So this is also a first try. <laughs> Um, so I wanted to think about the not sort of triage within a disaster, but how it is that we choose what we consider to be a disaster. Um, so the sort of macroethical decision making, um, what qualifies as a proper disaster for a humanitarian relief, um, because there are plenty of disasters happening, um, and uh, how do different actors and different stakeholders um, did make their decisions regarding those events. Um, so, I mean, this question of macro triage, I think, arises based on my reading that I've done. This is, is, is on two levels, really. So, first, there is a perspective of a humanitarian organization itself. And um, so, they've already said, well, that's, it's likely a humanitarian disaster. You know, um, and there's another one, we should divide up our resources, which should we respond to? Um, and of course, there are existing guidelines regarding you know, how many, usually, um, for example, um, doubling of existing mortality rates is considered already a disaster situation. Or you can tell you, or there are some other ones like under five, uh, mortality of under five year olds. Um, but interesting questions arise when, when, when we're getting around those thresholds. It's not there yet. So, you know, humanitarian agents go around measuring children's upper arm and they, okay, well, it's, it's really close, but should we actually leave? Because it can really turn around very quickly. So this is, uh, and obviously they, they are, they are limited resources, so they wouldn't have other places to go to, but for example, if they've been in some um, area for years already, it's difficult to leave, and so forth. So, and, and then there's this other level that includes more stakeholders than just the humanitarian agencies. So, uh, policy makers, armies, and, and so forth. And I would like to include that other level uh, within that discussion here today as well. So um, um, that's the sort of order I will uh, try to follow. What makes a disaster? What is a disaster? Uh, can one avoid a disaster? Can one blame a disaster on someone or something? And then I will look at the discourses of humanitarian disaster response. Um, I'm not really sure what the disciplinary background for that presentation today is. It's certainly not international relations and it's certainly not violence. I guess, it's, well, I did, my reading was mostly based on social science research, apologies, but also sort of humanitarian discourses. Um, so what is a disaster? Um, this is a very common uh, explanation that you find in dictionaries, Wikipedia's something, such as flood, tornado, fire, happens suddenly, causes much suffering and loss to many people. Um, so a complex disaster usually is associated with a sudden, unexpected onset. Massive damage uh, to materials, environment, um, large number of human casualties, potential complications of weather, and pollution, uh, insecurity due to political conflict, violence, uh, and of course, last but not least, media attention. We don't really know about disasters happening when there isn't someone filming or recognizing it as a disaster. Now, if we look at the uh, more sort of professional definitions of disaster, meaning those who are actually busy with disaster response, uh, an important uh, qualification to the disaster definition uh, is added. So, in addition to this sudden disruption 
there is this qualification that um, a disaster needs to exceed the community's or society's ability to cope using its own resources. So, um, for example, um, a Boston Marathon bombing a year ago that had almost 300 um, injured people, or five people were there, but 300 people were injured, isn't technically a disaster because it happened in the most well-equipped medical infrastructure in the world, like the Boston area where you have lots of capacity to, to treat people. And um, then there are, in the literature, there are these various algorithms out there, you know, what are the important, um, <coughs> what are the important things or important aspects of the disaster. You can see this vulnerability popping up here in various algorithms that this really uh, is, is an important aspect of what makes a disaster. So disaster occurs when a hazard impacts on a vulnerable population. Um, so this, this idea of vulnerability and human suffering really um, it comes out as crucial in, in causing our response to disasters. Um, but yeah, it's clear that not all suffering is a disaster. Of course, there are numerous events going on while we talk here that include human suffering, um, which are not considered disasters. Um, another question that has been asked: whether the sudden impact the qualification really is a crucial one, because there are many slow onset disasters. Um, the one that we've discussed in our disaster bioethics project a lot is the, is the refugee a problem in southern Europe. It's not something that just happened like that. It's been growing and growing over the years. So when, when, does, that, when does that become a disaster? Um, or um, if you look at the way that uh, humanitarian organizations are trying to define, we define disasters. Um, an example from um, a sort of list of top 10 underreported humanitarian stories. Uh, for, for example, tuberculosis has been defined as a disaster as well. Um, although there is no single event uh, or even pandemic that is mentioned, but it sort of becomes a catastrophe only in the spreadsheets of humanitarian organizations. And of course, you then would ask, well, you know, then, then obviously we have an obesity disaster and cardiac diseases disaster as well, right? And, but then if you step still further, you say, well, we have to die of something at some point, right? So we can't just continue this, uh, uh, this list of uh, victims in such a way. So one could say that there is a certain triage aspect to the very just definition of disaster itself. Right? If we say that disaster has to have a sudden onset, then there are certain things that don't qualify as a problem. Um, well, disaster definition don't usually contain much information about, you know, whether that is a man-made disaster or a natural disaster. Yet, our responses to events really, really take this into account, whether it's what we, whether we would consider disaster to be a natural or a man. Um, so natural disasters are ones that humans, as of yet, are not able to prevent, let's put it this way. For example, an earthquake, or a volcano eruption, or a tsunami. Um, we deal with consequences, but we are not able to prevent it. And then there are disasters with human factors. Um, mudslides, flooding, famine. So these are issues that are caused by global warming, or deforestation. So the vulnerability to a disaster is created by humans. And then finally, sort of man, straightforwardly man-made disasters, so various conflicts and wars and uh, industrial accidents. And of course, uh, the discussion is going on now whether any disaster really can only be attributed to nature anymore. Right? Because uh, human engagement with, with, with nature, be it sort of high-tech or low-tech, that means that we can always ask questions about human uh, responsibility. I have here a quote from the Public Health Guide in Emergency that sort of outlines this kind of thinking that, that none of the disasters really are free from this whose fault is it question. 
though many disasters arising from natural hazards would not have occurred or would have had a small impact on communities had it not been for actions by people. Deforestation, uh, or overgrazing with cattle, uncontrolled housing construction, and so forth and so on. Um, so this is an attempt uh, to classify disasters and, uh, and provide a gradient of disasters. So so that's by uh, a working group uh, led by uh, Randall Allen in uh, Helsinki. And um, they've drawn out this sort of four different things, or four different important components of a disaster, or what a disaster can be about. So the warfare or violence, and uh, whether that can be considered a disaster means there's a number of deaths from violence, a dislocation, um, the threshold being a particular number of refugees, famine. Um, it's linked to malnutrition of children and disease uh, related to child mortality. Now, if all four categories are involved, and this is a, what is called a complex humanitarian emergency, <clears throat> if there are three categories, it's a serious uh, complex humanitarian disaster. Um, the two categories, usually one of them is violence, so that means that it's a violent, violent complex humanitarian mm -hmm. disaster. Right, so there's a also discussion going on whether we have now more disasters than we've ever had, or is it just the impact of media reporting that we feel that there's constantly disaster going on? But I think it's quite clear that you know, sort of population boom, uh, increased urban living, these are all issues that would uh, that mean there are more victims than there would have been maybe otherwise or before. But it's clear that disaster planning and risk reduction is a priority for many governments and uh, organizations. So there is a belief, and I think it's well justified, that you can do something about a disaster before it sort of hits you. Um, um, a good example of how a particular disaster can have very different impact depending on your preparedness is the 2010 uh, earthquakes in Haiti and Chile. Um, so um, in Haiti, there was an earthquake of magnitude 7, and there was a huge loss of, of course, life, about 150,000 people are dead, and uh, most of the sort of infrastructure just uh, destroyed. Uh, some months later, there was a Chile earthquake in Chile. Uh, that was 8.8, .8, so that's 500 times stronger than the earthquake in Haiti, uh, which also triggered a tsunami. And uh, the number of uh, people killed was 525. And it wasn't in a less populated place, really. I mean, it was a really big, big earthquake, but it had an impact on, on a lot of population. So um, you can see how the sort of enforcement of construction codes and zoning codes and early warning systems and even sort of social programs can all reduce this, this vulnerability, which brings out an ethical question, really. Is it that? Which is step back from asking what disasters do we choose to respond to, to asking which disasters do we choose to actually avoid or minimize. Because there are always, or can, uh, how often can uh, disasters be really considered sudden, especially in areas which you know they are earthquake for example. Uh, there are many sort of, uh, well, it was just an interesting uh, coincidence a couple of days ago, a friend of mine uh, was living in Japan, moved back to Estonia. And uh, she was describing how everyone in Japan is really prepared and ready for another big earthquake, which uh, they call it the Tokai earthquake, which happens about uh, every 150 years. And, um, and really, I mean, everyone is prepared. Everyone has their food there at home for one month, food and water. Everyone has their backpack packed at all times. There are monthly community meetings about, you know, if it happens, where, where should we gather together, where should we go. So, so this seems to be not, to me, not a, a question of not whether a disaster will happen, but when it will happen. And obviously, you know, you can't, uh, can't say that there will be no human victims and so forth, but it's clear that the preparation for a particular earthquake really has an impact on how 
big losses are involved. Right. Okay. So, main discourses of disaster response. Um, based on my reading, I would say that there were sort of three trends that uh, came out, and obviously they are not clearly separated from each other, um, but nevertheless it is something that sort of uh, came out of my, my reading. Uh, so the humanitarian discourse, the human rights-based discourse, and the increasingly popular military humanitarian interventions. Um, the humanitarian response, of course, is, I guess, the oldest type of disaster response there is, based on this values of compassion and care, um, and not, undoubtedly much of humanitarian action in the past has been motivated by such thinking, and clearly also today, um, it is exactly this kind of humanitarian that actually works best in fundraising, for example. Emotional messages work, and even the more radical agencies that are usually focused on the political approaches to disaster relief, they even very seldom find it in their immediate interest to actually, or in their immediate financial interest to develop a sort of more political rights-based consciousness with their domestic publics when they are appealing for large funds. Uh, and uh, if we look at the way that this fundraising is happening in the Western countries, you can see that it's really made very convenient through all these various awareness showing campaigns. It's a trendy and convenient way to show that you care. Although some have been critical, saying that it's really self-expression replacing social understanding. Uh, for example, there was a there was a campaign, million faces petition to control arms, where you have to post your selfie so as to raise awareness, which conveniently combines this, uh, these two trends. Um, now, for the for the supporters of this humanitarian um, discourse. You could say that even human rights are a bit too complicated or, or politically complicated factor. And they do their best to stay away from the sort of local and international uh, politics. And so the emergency and exceptionality of humanitarian action really tends to suspend all other concerns. And also what they what the um, proponents of that response say is that well, human rights law, law although it is um, ratified by many, it really sort of also is, there is a huge failure application of it, so it's not very useful in a way. Um, but of course, as we all know, there are many problems with this sort of humanitarian discourse. One of the sentimental, paternalistic, and privileged discourse of philanthropy and charity, for example. So political responsibility is not demanded. Um, from local or even international actors, rather. So that, that makes this charity approach uh, open to political abuse because focus on um, emergency issues um, disallows attention for structural issues or context of history. In a way, people should be saved after the earthquake, but then they are, set, then they are free to die of starvation and poverty. Also, humanitarian aid in such a form can be seen as legitimizing existing inequalities and colonial hierarchies. Um, right. So in a way, this, this via this humanitarian discourse, political domination and violence are translated into the discourse of suffering and trauma. And the logic of compassion tends to replace um, the demand for justice. And of course, uh, critics of the humanitarian discourse tend to say also that human rights approach is more dignified for those who actually are victims of the disaster. Um, now, when, while humanitarian organizations often see themselves as opposed to politics, especially if we define politics uh, through state action, um, then, then still, the satisfaction with the solely humanitarian approach has been around for many decades. Um, 
if you think about the uh, birth of one of the most successful humanitarian organizations, the Médecins Sans Frontières, in the 70s, uh, then one of the reasons for their splitting from the Red Cross uh, was exactly that they were not satisfied with the sort of neutrality uh, politics of the Red Cross, for example, during the Second World War and the Holocaust. So um, instead of the sort of Red Cross neutrality policy and the, and the, and the respect for sovereignty that, that the Red Cross has, MSF has wanted to sort of advocate and witness and to speak out and, and be a witness to the suffering and, and ultimately uh, announce borders irrelevant for for human suffering. Um, so this kind of approach demands responsible politics, demands justice, uh, and sees human suffering as a result of shortcomings in statecraft. And, and some of that discourse as well linked to international humanitarian law. Um, the, the literature, at least my reading of it, seems to suggest that this human rights based, based uh, approach is becoming more prevalent. Uh, and, and to focus solely on the sort of human suffering, decontextualized, uh, is seen as either sort of impossible or even dangerous. And of course, many humanitarian organizations do combine these approaches, that of human rights and, and humanitarian. Um, and I think a realization that you cannot sort of set yourself separate from the politics of it all is, is, is really prevalent. Um, I have here some examples from MSF, uh, which is a very sort of self-reflective organization and has published a lot of, um, on its own workings. So for example, humanitarian research is often used for other purposes. Uh, and the example is the, um, the MSF, MSF report on Kosovo that was used by NATO in sort of after justification of their engagement. So MSF had been there, had done research and has said that this, in fact, is a disaster. Humanitarian aid is needed. So what may tell us to provide all kinds of other aid as well. <laughs> um, so, or the question of uh, how, that there is no neutral ground in disaster situations. So this impossibility of neutrality, really. Um, and again, an example from MSF. Uh, well, most of MSF, international MSF was providing care for Bosnians and Albanians there. The Greek MSF decided to provide help for Serbians. So they went to Belgrade. And they were evicted from MSF. At least for, for a while, the, 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 the Greek chapter. So again, this question of, you, you know, which, what are the, so what, which victims qualify? The question, really. Um, and, and the good example that I recently heard from the um, Central African Republic, uh, where MSF is also, which has been in a sort of pre-genocide situation already for a while now. Um, so what, what, what the humanitarian agencies um, in Central African Republic are doing now is that they're trying to get people away from harm's way, so they are sort of providing safe transportation for uh, certain ethnic or religious minorities so that they can escape. And yet, at the same time, if you think, what is the point of ethnic cleansing? It is precisely to remove certain populations from certain areas. And the humanitarian agents are well aware that the people they are transporting from harm's way are probably never going to come back to their homes. So how can you say that this is purely humanitarian if, in fact, you are with some other political interests? Okay. So, and this takes me to this sort of military humanitarian interventions topic, which I'm uh, divided into two, the security discourse and the benevolent dictatorship of humanitarians. Um, again, there's no clear difference between those two, and um, they both involve military and humanitarian activities. But I wanted to, to keep them separate, mostly because to really emphasize their different disciplinary uh, foundations, I guess. Um, so, security is the buzzword today, so I, I did put it in, <laughs> not that I know anything more of it. Um, but it seems to be a sort of, yeah, based on sort of international relations literature. Um, and, and the first one being more normative, saying that, well, 
military humanitarian intervention is the way to go if you want to provide security. The other being more sort of critical social science approach, looking critically at what it is that the humanitarian agencies, whose agendas are they really pushing in disaster response. Um, so um, there seems to be a sort of um, more or less shared understanding that humanitarianism has really, really developed uh, and become much more of an important field in the past 20 or 30 years. It is even said that it has replaced politics. Uh, politics has retreated while humanitarian language has marched on in global affairs. And certainly if we look at the interventions of the last quarter of the 20th century at least, has meant that the sort of principle of sovereignty that had ruled until then is, is not so absolute anymore. The rise in, the, in um, the number of activities of humanitarian nature uh, in the 1980s has been linked to the end of communism by some. Um, and I quote here Ronald Roman, um, when the tide of ideology retreated, humanitarian action gradually came to occupy the space left empty by politics, supplying uh, a concrete content for the ideal of solidarity. So humanitarianism as a new repertoire for public action. Replacing politics. Um, so this first security discourse is, um, as I said, in this sense, more of a realist, neoliberal thinking of uh, international relations literature, where it's all about strategic interests of countries, uh, and those interests, of course, not being only security related, but uh, related tra trade interests, for example. So this humanitarian military intervention would mean that. You, Participants would work towards uh, peace and prosperity, uh, and, and peace often, oftentimes seen as really instrumental in terms of actually successfully um, supporting commerce and trade. So this would make um, a foreign aid and mission, missions an outcome of economic and political interest in other countries. And especially after 9-11, uh, sort of management of the desperation and conflict uh, we're seeing in political theory of international relations literature as sort of main ways of escaping this threat of global chaos to the Western world, as we've heard today. Um, so these various uh, institutional corporations, civil public corporation, public private corporation, is seen as sort of crucial and necessary part of that military humanitarian intervention in governing this kind of chaos. And, and this does not only involve responding to the most acute needs, needs of, uh, of food and shelter and medical attention, but they often involve policing and uh, monitoring violations, um, providing institutional capacity building and so on. And yes, as we, as, we, as we heard today, this discourse of security has been increasingly applied to, also to health, economic and social needs, not merely military needs. This, what I would say is the security discourse doesn't really problematize the inclusion of human and humanitarian work, but it is seen as a sort of necessary for successful governance of, of global affairs. Now, the benevolent dictatorship of humanitarianism does pro problematize this dependence between humanitarian and military work. Um, and I quote here Lawrence McFall's, contemporary humanitarian ethic raises the alleviation of physical suffering into a moral absolute. Humanitarianism has become the secular religion Millennium. And for the successful implementation of this new religion, one needs efficiency and professionalism. Exactly something that the military could provide. But not only the military. I mean, what is clear looking back to the case is that the humanitarian industry, some say it, uh, has also professionalized a lot. Uh, so uh, there are so many standards being, uh, being uh, provided and so forth. So, this has happened over the past, in past decades, and it's also often described as a sort of competitive humanitarianism nowadays. Um, increasingly, one in this mix up of military humanitarian intervention, um, there is this argument that humanitarianism is trumping international law and national sovereignty. And it is much easier nowadays to confer legitimacy through humanitarian argument, although legitimacy does not always translate into legality. Um, 
Um, so while traditionally humanitarian and military international organizations distance themselves from each other, they often, of course, rely on each other as well. Is it for legitimation purposes, as I said? Is it for increased security? Um, is it just for logistics purposes? Um, and yet, um, this is a quote from Lawrence and Pauls, the benevolent dictatorship of humanitarian government based on scientific expertise and relying on the institutional form of the non-governmental organization has become the uncontested and uncontestable radical biopower of the age. So there's you know, social science buzzwords for you. <laughs> right, so this, uh, this uh, so this tries to problematize this relationship, and and I also many many see problems with it. It's not only that social scientists observing this military humanitarian interventions are saying that well, it's not clear who's working for whom here. I mean, humanitarian agencies themselves are very well aware of these problems, and some of them are really uh, really working hard in order not to be associated with any military uh, military actions or. or military presence even in the same country where they both, both might be working because they, they see this as, uh, as problematic for their security in the long term and the trust that the population has in them. Uh, and yet, if, if um, Angton Haube has written that if, if the disaster planning increasingly relies on uh, mostly military or military-led interventions, then this automatically, of course, limits the scope of the action. So the focus, for, for example, would be more infrastructure rather than policy intervention and so forth. Um, the, the, the study that was done on um, disaster response after the Asian tsunami 
the Tsunami Evaluation Coalition, and I will read here. So the study found that it was television coverage rather than any more formal assessment of needs that provided the basis on which funding decisions were based. And that funding decisions were taken up in response to domestic political pressure in donor countries. So it was all about agencies competing to promote their brand and, and, and so forth. Um, so this is a sort of descriptive situation of uh, our responses to to disasters and the question is, is there something that can we do something about it if we don't think that this is justified? That our response to um, disasters is not consistent. Um, and of course I think that's a very sort of philosophy driven question because philosophers like everything to be consistent. Um, and I really enjoyed um, Joe Wolf's book um, that came out a few years ago um, on ethics and public policy or something like that where he, uh, he has a sort of trained philosopher um, discusses his experience being in various public engagement bodies and committees and so forth. And it's really, I would say, eye-opening to all academic philosophers to see how much, um, how much this, this need for consistent response and justification plays in the real world. I don't mean that we should give it up, absolutely not. But for example, if we think about how, um, how there, there tends to be a desire to say that emotional responses to disasters are not good enough, or that we shouldn't count on them, and that we should privilege rational responses. I don't know if that the case. That would be the case. I mean, I think that's just uh, that, of course, uh, mirrors this sort of unhappiness that philosophy has had with emotions, and including emotions in, within a rational response to something. Uh, uh, but I think that maybe we could actually allocate more room for non-rational uh, non responses or traditional elementals so to human disasters so that we can do better with them. At least we shouldn't say that they are irrational. Right, yeah, so um, the question is whether, whether consistent response is possible or, or even desirable. And I mean, I want to